the, uh, the back of that. I have a picture here of a uh, young man. I was um, praying. I was doing a revival for uh, Rich Cox in Redlands. And uh, as I was praying, a, uh, I felt a presence, not God. And uh, I was uh, sitting there, and I finally looked up, and there was this young man looking at me and praying with me and trying to get a look at my notes. His name is Frankie. I now carry his picture. It was very obvious to me that Frankie illustrates a lot of the people that we minister to today. <clears throat> he began to ask me what I was going to preach on, asked me if I had kids, asked me what my wife was like. This is during prayer meeting, man. And so I quickly, you know, it doesn't take Einstein to figure this out. There's something this young man's looking for in the kingdom of God. He's looking for a family. He's looking for hope. So I asked him, I said, tell me about your dad. He goes, I haven't got a dad. He said he left, never met him. Tell me about your mom. Well, uh, she's okay. And so here he is in a prayer meeting. And every night thereafter, he'd be sitting there right there asking me what I was going to preach on. And uh, I really got a heart bond with this young man. I want to preach on deliverance. I'm here. Before we eat donuts, we're going to pray together. I believe in deliverance. I believe that God's been speaking to this tent and the people in it. <laughs> and I think He wants to move us to new dimensions. Do you believe it? There are some things we need to leave here this week. Not drag Him in like a cat next year. But let's be different. You know, there's a lot of terrorism going on, but some of the worst terrorism there is is not from your mama been slobbing. <laughs> the worst terrorism is from the devil himself. And I want to preach on Delivered for Conquest out of First Chronicles 4. You've heard it already, but that's okay. Verse 9, And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bear him with sorrow. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. Delivered for conquest. I want to first of all look with you at the condition of the harvest that we're called to reach. Now, there can be no doubt, beloved, that we're reaching a very unique harvest with deep spiritual problems. Here we have a man named Jabez. The Bible doesn't really uh, tell us a lot about uh, his father. We see nothing about his father at all. And uh, we see uh, uh, simply a man with a very bad start to seeking a, a better ending. I want you to know the devil loves to pass sentence on you and I early in life. Have you noticed? I am gratified by the youth I see in this tent. But I also understand that there are curses involved. There are backgrounds involved. There are things involved in your life that are hindering you today. But I believe in the blood of Jesus Christ to set you free today. The devil loves to put an ending and to try to put us down early in life. And our text gives us some hints of what may have hindered this man from his birth. His name is Jabez. You've heard it preached. I don't need to belabor that. It means sorrow. And you know, a lot of commentaries say, well, uh, he named him, she named him sorrow because uh, her labor pains uh, uh, were bad. Well, if that were true, everybody here would be named Jabez. Thank God the woman ate the apple. Amen. And so here we have a, 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 um, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, problems. And I do not believe it was sorrow. We do not really know what it is. We can go any direction. There's no mention of his father. He could have been illegitimate or abandoned. He was definitely in a single parent household. Perhaps poverty made him an unwelcome addition, which is always rejection. And because of two irresponsible people, there are now many people in the world today with bad beginnings. And the devil loves to put an ending to our lives early in life. Aren't you glad you found Jesus Christ? 
but it's not automatic. See, in today's world, there is a strong feeling of fatalism that is inbred in those in society who have bad beginnings. This goes the, the gamut of life. We could talk economic. We could talk racial. We could talk illegitimate. We could talk abandonment. But the devil loves to pass sentence early in life. And Jabez could be an apt description of many of the people that come to your church, Pastor. There's an article here that uh, really caught my attention. There was a woman who went to an abortion clinic to kill her baby. And uh, while she was there, she was waiting uh, for her turn. And uh, this story said that shots rang out uh, and she was forced to run for her life. What's interesting, though, is she is now suing the abortion clinic because they did not have adequate security. And she was, quote, forced to raise her daughter who was now eight years old. Now think of this. If this little girl does not already know what's going on, she, she soon will. And I want to tell you about a miracle that will follow her all the days of her life. That will affect her relationships. Uh, that will affect her ability to give herself. Uh, that will affect her ability to trust. Uh, that will affect her ability about a miracle to even have a decent marriage. I was doing a Sunday school and I, I forget what I was teaching on. But a young man, 18 years old, I was talking about family relationships, and he raised his hand and he made this statement. He said, my mother loved me because I was her son, but she hated me because I was a man. That caught my attention, and I believe that you and I are reaching a very unique and a very troubled generation like never before. This world's insane, folks. What you're looking at is curses. What you're looking at is an absence and a lack and a loss of an ability to think straight. We had an interesting thing that happened in Las Vegas, amongst a lot of things interesting that happened in Las Vegas. The Luxor Hotel is a large pyramid. I was one day looking up, I was looking up, all the rooms are uh, they're on the wall of the pyramid, and there's about a four-foot wall that separates you uh, uh, from, from your room and about a 200-foot you know, fall. And uh, I said, one day, <clears throat> one day, mark it down, guys, one day somebody's going to make this jump. Well, sure enough, they did. Young man jumped off, landed flat in the salad bar. <laughs> Gives a whole new meaning to toss salad, doesn't it? <clears throat> but anyway, they had it open in four hours. This is a crazy world, folks. Somebody said these words, this, the new century will present a host of challenges. We're beginning to face many even now. Alvin Toffler calls the span from the mid-1950s to 2005 the hinge of history. Lance Morrow speaks of the coming millennium <clears throat> excuse me, as a cosmic divide. The 1990s were the transforming boundary between one age and another between the scheme of things that has disintegrated and another that is taking shape. Proverbs 30, 11 through 14 says, There is a generation that curses their father and does not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. And 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 4, uh, you know the Scripture. It talks about a dangerous time to live. It talks about a wicked time to live. You know the words, covet boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, fierce, incontinent, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures uh, more than lovers of God. That sounds like 2002. See, what's happened, beloved, is there is a curse that has been loosed in the earth by sin. You know that sin by its very nature gets worse and worse. The Bible tells us that sin is running its course to a climax to the rapture. And you and I are called to reach that generation. We get the uncut stuff, folks. Racing towards 2001. Interesting book to read now. Listen to this article. Dysfunctional families, alcohol, drug and sexual addictions, pornography, 
physical abuse, violence in childhood will also continue to grow at an alarming rate in the next decade. George Callup Jr. said these words, the sex-related issues are going to be the most important issues facing the church in the foreseeable future. Abortion, AIDS, premarital sex, homosexuality, all these are going to be at the vortex. Another article says these words, sexual activity among teens climbed the 1980s. The proportion of girls aged 15 to 19 who have had sexual intercourse rose from 47% in 1982 to 53% in 1988. And another article says 6 million households are headed by single parents and each year more than 1 million teens will become pregnant. Four out of five will be unmarried. 30,000 under the age of 15. 90% of the babies born to blacks between the ages of 15 and 19 are born out of, of wedlock. And Life, Tra Life Trans Magazine put it this way, a child of divorced parents whose grandparents have also separated will need a computer program to tell which relatives are where and in which family they began in. That's the generation we're reaching. Can you say amen? Now, with that in mind, you need to be concerned because this is more than just a sin problem. With that in mind, we must take the issues of curses very, very seriously. And i got to tell you, there's not nearly enough preaching in our churches on the curses of sin. Proverbs 26.2 says these words, as the word by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse, causeless, shall not come. But I'll tell you, folks, with a cause, it will come. Deuteronomy 27 says these words, Curse be he. You know, when you see the word curse, it ought to get your attention. He goes on and uses the words, Curse be he that commits adultery. Curse be he that sheds innocent blood. You know, we've killed like 50 million babies by abortion. Curse be he. That's a homo. Well, they're born that way. Well, you better change something quick. He talks about perversion. It talks about idolatry. 23.2 says, An illegitimate child shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his tenth generation. Because what we're dealing with, beloved, a curse is an invisible force that hinders a life and therefore hinders revival. I was preaching on illegitimacy in a church in Missouri one time. And I preached this sermon, and before uh, a service, uh, a young lady came up and asked me to, me and my wife, to come and stay at her house, or, or, or eat dinner at her house, rather, after service. Uh, I preached a sermon on illegitimacy. We broke that curse, uh, and I got to understand, this woman, uh, uh, she was a horrible housekeeper. This house uh, was a disaster. You didn't know whether to sit on the floor, on the driveway, which was better. Horrible situation. Uh, but I preached that sermon. She came up to me, and she said, we need to take a rain check on this, uh, and I wasn't sure why, but something broke in that young lady's life, uh, and from that day forward, uh, she was a wonderful housekeeper, she became a witness for Jesus Christ, uh, the joy returned to her life, uh, because folks, people need more than sermon, they need deliverance. Now listen to me, now don't you bring your wife up to me after service, that's your concern. Pastor Mitchell came to our church in Las Vegas. It was a men's discipleship. And in a men's discipleship, he preached a sermon on illegitimacy. And I want to tell you, buddy, heaven fell in that room. He did an altar call. And I had preached on this, but I'll never forget. He prayed, and we cast out that curse. And I'll never forget his words. He said, gentlemen, you're going to be different from this day forward. And he said, you're going to read your Bible. You're going to get more revelation. You're going to be more anointed. There's going to be a clarity in your life. Because I'll say it again, Pastor, they need more than preaching. They need deliverance. Jabez's concern was that his name 
and his heritage and his unfair start would follow him all the days of his life, but he was able to appeal to a higher court. And don't worry here this morning, beloved. Maybe you are illegitimate. Maybe you have had an abortion. Maybe these other things. Don't worry. I'm going to get you out of this. You can appeal to a higher court. Your life can be better. Your ministry can be with more clarity because Jesus Christ came to set the captive free. Let's look then at the condition of the ministry. Being a pastor has never seen a time of more challenge and more neglect. Newsweek magazine, of all places, said these words. The power to heal. The fate of the Spirit is relegated to religious specialists who have little to say about their followers' well-being. That's Newsweek magazine. Another quote put it this way, Many pastors in America today don't understand disease. They don't understand disease, and they don't understand psychological problems. They know how to get you born again. They know how to balance a budget. They know how to visit hospitals, marry people, and bury the dead. But they don't know what to do with, with disease and problems of the mind. So they'll send you out into the street to, to an unregenerated and unrenewed specialist in a disease and maybe even call them the anointed of God. Ralph Turnbull said these words, If the pulpit does not proclaim with passion the eternal message of man's deliverance, the future is dark indeed. The decline in preaching passion and the new emphasis upon know-how programs for the faithful within the church have stullified the clear aims of the Christian faith. A paradox of the present hour lies in the fact that when the pulpit was not dealt with, the inner disease of man, others on the outside have become obsessed with the nature of and actions of man, but he's still lost. You know what, preacher? Our job is to get him found, saved, healed, and delivered. The Bible for salvation is the word sozo. It does not just mean saved. It means saved. It means healed. It means delivered. It means brand new. It washes not just on the outside, but all the way through. Remember the soap advertisement? You're clean through and through. It literally means brand new. It means set free. It means something changed. It means you're a brand new creature with a brand new beginning. And the past no longer haunts you. What are you haunted by, Christian? I want to tell you, you can be free this morning. How many believe it today? You can be free. I was talking to an evangelist. He's praying for a woman saved 15 years. She's still going to see a chiropractor. One of our churches. Listen to me. Chiropractors are warlocks. Oh, I go to a Christian chiropractor. No, you go to a Christian warlock. I won't even mention Harry Potter. Oh, I just did. We've been called by God to help people, preacher. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. That word oppressed means to exercise power over. That means that something on the outside has come on the inside. The question you always ask, can a Christian have a demon? Well, the Christian word for possessed doesn't mean uh, the way you and I would think. Uh, we're not talking about guys that walk around town uh, and, you know, they haven't blinked in three years. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> the word literally means dominazi. It's influenced, afflicted, tormented and vexed and there are people in our churches yes they're saved yes they love God but they're still vexed and they're still tormented somebody said these words demon possession can be contrasted with demon influence all demon activity does not result in demon possession there is a vast difference between demon possession and demon influence and you can hear the plea in Jabez's words he says oh God don't let what my name means influence my future oh God I want to be effective but this past this name 
Oh my word. Uh, he said, it's killing me. God, you got to help me. Uh, how many here want God's help this morning? Uh, you're crying out. You said, oh God, this name, this past. There are people in our churches with the same plea. What is wrong with me? Why do I hate men? Why do I hate authority? Why do I seem to want to be a rebel? Why can't I get rid of these thoughts, these emotions, these sins, these lusts, these fears? Well, I've got good news for you, partner. It's not just the way you are. And there's help this morning. There is help for you because the devil loves to tell us uh, that this is just the way you are. He loves to tell us uh, that you'll never change. But I want you to know, Ephesians 6.12 says you have an enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, uh, but against principalities, powers, uh, rulers of darkness uh, in, in this world, uh, against spiritual wickedness uh, in high places. And that is why you and I, men, what a privilege. We have this gospel and we can help people. You know, I was talking to a pastor. There are churches today that have psychiatrists on staff. Man, they are, they're the craziest people on the planet. We have been bombarded with humanistic Freudian thinking. But the Bible says that we have been anointed for a purpose, Pastor. Ephesians 4, 7 and 8, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And I want to tell you, God has gifted us and God has anointed us so that God's people could be free. That's all I'm going to say about gifting. See, my people don't need a psychiatrist. My people don't need AA. My people don't need a 12-step program. They need the power of God through an anointed man. Isaiah 49, 25, But thus saith the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away. The prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contends with you, and I will save thy children. But ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses in me, to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Sumeria and to the ends of the earth. And the word delivered means rescued. It means to escape. It means to be wrestled free. It means a supernatural deliverance. And I want to tell you, we're going to pray for some people today. You can leave this conference this week and you're going to be different. So let's look then at a major problem that we need to look at. See, the believer in Jesus Christ has a part to play in this and a job to do. You know, our conference is called Deliverance and Enlargement. You know, nothing stops a church quicker than a church that's obsessed with self-maintenance. You know what I mean? You, you know, you're, you're up there counseling uh, till midnight. You're brain wrestling with every neurotic woman in the city. Your poor wife wants to go home. You know, they, they tell me that uh, in the Phantom of the Opera, that he had, he had his organ down in the sewers and uh, the music would come up through the, the grates to the ears of the people. And you know what? There's some churches that... You know, there's no victory. It's more like songs from the sewer. You know, somebody told me we have a very joyful and happy church. You know why? Because they have the joy of the Lord. They're set free. They're not in a constant state of self-maintenance uh, and always talking about why this, why that, uh, why can't I be free, why that sin, uh, why this, why that. This will affect your life. This will affect our fellowship. You know, racism comes from rejection. You know, I could, you know, I wonder, you know, I wouldn't doubt if there was just one brother here this week that probably said, ain't no white people, ain't no black people up there preaching. Where's, where's the brothers? Yeah. 
You know, people always say, they're saying, well, you're, you're white, Pastor. I'm not white. That's white. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, kind, of, I'm kind of orange. What's this new saying? You're too white. What's that supposed to mean? We have a multiracial church. Blacks by black, you know, by our behavior, red by our embarrassment for it, and white by our redemption. Racism will kill us. You know, there's a movement in Las Vegas called Victory Outreach. Some of the best spaghetti dinner ticket sellers you ever saw in your life. <laughs> you know, what, what, what is this? You know, I, I said something to a guy, he goes... What, what is that, Walmart? You know what? You know what? Get delivered from your, from your racial pride. I got a brother back here, a good friend, goes to my church, Richard Twine. Yes, amen. Black. When he came into my church, he was a white hating black. He was he was as close, uh, amen, to a black panther as you can be. And he came to my church and he's going, I hate that guy. I hate that. Who I'm taking nothing from a white man, but he kept coming back. Now him and his wife have pastured. Yes, amen. His wife is white. See, don't, don't kid the kidder, buddy. Don't kid the kidder. I feel you. We got this pride and we got this idea, you know, that we're going to bring this in. I don't mind personality. My gosh, you know, I, I, I love it, you know. But you know what? Uh, we're all of God's children. And whatever God brings into your church, you better love them because I'll tell you right now, they will know if you don't. They know, preacher. We need to get people free. There's some people here. You know, I thank God that our fellowship's been dewormed, but have you? You know, you know, talking to a rebel opens you to a demon spirit, you know. Oh, you know, I'm just kind of keeping the lines of communication open in case they repent, you know. And, uh, well, they're my friend, you know. No, you're opening yourself up to a demon spirit. Rebellion is witchcraft. And that's why you came to conference with, with ooze coming out of your ear. And, you know, and we can feel you a mile away. I want to tell you, let's get delivered and go on. They know where we are. Now, what happens to us, though? Where does that come from? It's because we don't get delivered. We bring this right into our life. There's an interesting scripture. It says in 2 Timothy 2.26, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will, or literally his timing. See, if you want to hang on to that little lust problem, Pastor, mark it down. At a crucial time, the devil will bring it in a little hachi into your church, and that's going to kill you.
comes in later. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine, and he said he was amazed how that uh, there's things in his life he thought were gone, never thought of, but at a critical moment for him was when he was asked to preach in conference, this thing suddenly came out of nowhere. You know what? Don't, don't, come on. Don't be a Christian and just put the dog on, okay? Just be honest what's in there and get set free. Because if you don't, at a crucial time, that will come true. See, the key word in the scripture at this level is the word when. How many heard about Dolly, the cloned sheep? You know, Dolly's got arthritis. Five and a half years later, the cloned sheep's got arthritis. Now, we don't know if she had bitter DNA. We don't know. But uh, um, all all we know is that five and a half years down the road, she develops uh, arthritis. Uh, And I want to tell you, if you just try to clone your people, you know, you preach your sermon, you preach your sermon, you preach your sermon. You're too busy to get involved in their lives. Uh, You're too busy to pray for them and be open and available for counseling. You're just cloning them out uh, and you're not praying for them. Uh, One day, you're going to go, Hello, Dolly! Something's going to come out at a crucial moment. And I want to tell you, if we're going to go on for God, deliverance is a theology that we must embrace. See, we we know the scripture, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Well, that's one, pride, but I can name a few more. I could name lust. I could name covetousness. I could name rebellion because these are things that are just waiting to be released after promotion. And the Bible uses the word when. It's crucial to look at this morning. Proverbs 30, 21 through 23. There are four things that the earth cannot bear. For a servant when he reigns, a fool when he's filled with meat, an odious woman when she is married, and a handmaid that is heir to her Mistress, Listen to what one translation says. A slave who becomes a king, a rebel when he prospers, a bitter woman when she finally marries, and a servant girl who marries her mistress' husband. And I suppose you could put your own translation that would say a prideful disciple who gets a Bible study, a successful and talented pastor who thinks he's outgrown the fellowship, A bitter pastor's wife who drives away people with her words, which leads to the pastor running off with one of the women in the church. These are deep ingrained problems. These are things that we have not been honest with. We have not been honest with that rebellion. We have not been honest with that lust. We have not been honest with these things working in our life. And mark it down, the devil at his will will touch it at just the right time. Now, there's an answer. Aren't you glad? (laughs) See, Jabez was a man who refused to accept the verdict of life. This man had a desire for enlargement. He did not allow himself the luxury of self-pity. He appealed to the highest court, and beloved God loves to reverse the world's verdicts about you. Pastor Mitchell read this translation. Uh, You remember first night, uh, oh, that you would wonderfully bless me and help me in my work. Uh, Bless me with disciples. Uh, Keep me from evil and disaster. And God requested, granted him uh, his request. Uh, I got good news for you. God can overcome your parentage. See, I've been pastoring uh, not very long, but one thing I am very aware of, uh, that generation that we're reaching can be set free and go on and be great men and women for God. In Isaiah, God is called the everlasting Father. It literally means the progenitor of a new life. Because it is not just God the Father. It is God our Father. And you and I have a new uh, parentage. Uh, There are people here, uh, you're frustrated. Uh, You're a frustrated worker. You're a frustrated wife or a husband, a pastor, a disciple. You feel hindered in your life. Uh, I've got good news for you. Uh, The Bible says, if we shall call upon the name of the Lord, we shall not be ashamed. That literally means no delay. It literally means instant touch. uh, And beloved, uh, I believe before we have donuts, uh, we can feel better about ourselves. (laughs) Hallelujah. What happens is a curse is broken. Illegitimacy is a curse, friend, that will hinder you. Abortion 
is a curse that will hinder you. Hatred, bitterness, rejection, these things all play out in our lives. And I'm not saying this is the, you know, I understand the flesh, I understand the decisions, the mind, all the, I, I understand all of that, but I also understand that we are anointed to set the captive free. See, what happens is the curse is broken. And when a curse is broken, a miracle will take place and the curse of the fathers that goes to the third and fourth generations is broken and we are given a new identity. We are now first fruits from the progenitor of a new life and the Bible says you are, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Jesus Christ became a curse for us, did He not? So you and I could be free. The Bible says that the Son therefore shall make you free. You shall be free indeed. John 6.37 And him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Romans 9.33 And whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. What a great conference this has been. I believe we have been touched by God for another gear to go do great things for God. I believe God has been speaking to us about leaving some things behind. We've already heard two sermons on deliverance at least. We've prayed. God has touched us. There's been a touch in this tent. But I believe this is another area we need to look at very seriously this morning. Curses are very real. I wonder if we could all stand to our feet. If I could be so bold to do this. I'm doing this because I believe the Lord wanted me to do this. I want to tell you, I didn't, there was a lot of things I would rather have preached on. The devil has fought this sermon from the get-go. The first two times I tried to print it, the printer broke. Now, maybe God didn't want me to preach it. <laughs> but I just don't think God works that way. I want you to lift your hands to God. I want you to say, Jesus, I'm a child of God. I thank you that you have set me free. I take authority. I take dominion over every curse, every inherited curse, every blood curse, and every word curse. God, give me a new beginning. Be a new child. I forgive every person who has ever sinned against me. I cast out hatred, bitterness, rejection, perversion, and murder. Every lying spirit. I take authority over illegitimacy. And every evil work. I receive the blessing of God. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And I receive my healing in Jesus' name. Let's begin to give Him praise right now. God, 